Living a life of intention starts within. Dora and I are excited to help you find the path to co-mindfulness living through our co-mindfulness masterclass. Our seven co-mindfulness principles will take you on a remarkable path towards health and happiness. For more information and to sign up for the masterclass, visit comindfulnessproject.com. People are yearning for information. Having the opportunity to encourage people and to educate people and inspire people. It's amazing to be able to say we'll carve out time to take care of ourselves. There's something for everyone. Dr. Freeman Rabowski is a recognized leader and innovator in American higher education. Under President Obama, he chaired the U.S. President's Advisory Commission on Educational Excellence for African Americans. He has been named one of the 100 most influential people in the world and one of the 10 best college presidents by time. And he is the recipient of a Top American Leaders Award from the Washington Post and the Harvard Kennedy School's Center for Public Leadership. He and his wife, Jacqueline, live in Owings Mills, Maryland and have a son named Eric. Trisha and I are so excited today to have Dr. Rabowski with us, who is the president of University of Maryland, Baltimore County. So welcome, Dr. Rabowski. Delighted to be here with both of you. Well, we want to start at the beginning, really. We want to know a little bit about you, your family, and your path to becoming the president of UMBC. Let me start by saying I am from Birmingham. I grew up in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, the son of educators, and I was privileged to participate in the Civil Rights Children's March with Dr. King, and I spent a week, five days in jail, what was what I would call both horrific and empowering. It was a terrible experience for the children, but it also empowered us to know that the world could be better and we could have some role in that. And that experience, coupled with my love of mathematics, led me to want to do work in education, to help children to be excited about learning, about reading, and especially about mathematics and science. I get goosebumps doing math. Let me tell you that right now. And I've been president at UMBC now for almost 30 years. When you talk about math, like what level are you talking about? (laughs) Uh, I enjoy math at many levels from the work I did in abstract algebra, I have a grad degree in abstract algebra and master's level, then PhD in statistics in higher education administration. I actually did statistics across the social sciences in helping to understand data and an analysis of trends, for example. But I enjoy working with children. UMBC spends a lot of time working with children in our area in inner city schools. Our campus is adjacent to the BWI airport, but we get into that city a lot. And we've had tremendous success with a STEAM center at Lakeland Elementary and some of the schools around there working with North of Grumman. And I can get on the floor with fourth graders and solve word problems, and I'm in heaven. Well, one of the things we definitely want to talk about today are the amazing graduates that have come from UMBC. And there's one at the forefront of what's happening in our world today. And of course, that's Dr. Kizzy Corbett. Right, Kizmikia Corbett, but her nickname has always been Kizzy also. And she is the leading scientist in the effort to develop a vaccine. You must be so proud, number one. And number two, I know it encouraged you to do what you did recently. So talk about that. We are thrilled that Dr. Corbett is doing the work that she's doing. In fact, she is from what we can determine, the first African-American woman to ever create a vaccine. So she's making history. That's in the world. That's in the world. And to me, the first thing I think about is that little girls of all backgrounds, of all races, can look and say, look at this young woman, she's in her 30s, who has created a vaccine that will save millions of lives. It is so exciting. She's right there in Montgomery County, as you know, at NIH. And what's significant is that we recruited her to UMBC when she was 17 to be in our Mauhoff Scholars Program for future scientists and physician scientists. And what's particularly significant is she comes out of rural North Carolina, Hillsborough, North Carolina, and has always been intellectually curious with a strong sense of self and has done extraordinarily well, graduated from UMBC, went back to Chapel Hill for the PhD, came back to Maryland to do the postdoc at NIH has been interested in this area for some time in immunology and is the lead scientist. And she brought others onto the team, including another black woman on that team. So it's just wonderful to know that NIH supports that level of diversity 
and for people to see that children of all types can grow up to be scientists who can save lives. Now, with that said, she had been saying to me for weeks that they were having a hard time at NIH in finding people of color to participate in the Moderna trial. And I became so concerned about this because we want to know that the vaccine is effective for all types of people as we work to convince all types of people that the vaccine is for them. And so my wife and I, Jackie and I, decided to participate in the Moderna trial, and we went to the Center for Vaccine Development at the University of Maryland Medical School in Baltimore and did have a very positive experience working with people of all backgrounds, men and women, in taking the two injections and determining how we were feeling and in working with them regularly every week in reporting just how we're doing. And so we've been through that process. And so we've become poster kids for older citizens who want to be safe in this COVID environment. Why is it important for people all over, specifically in the Black community, to consider doing the vaccine? Can you talk about historically why it might not be something people want to jump into and just really explain that all to us? We've gone through a period when so many people have questioned the value of science and evidence and listening to experts. We would all say, thank goodness for Dr. Fauci as somebody we trust. And what I would say to you is that that situation becomes exacerbated when looking at people of color and in particular right now, African-Americans, because we have seen such unbelievably grueling examples. I mean, examples that make us cringe to this day. I grew up in Birmingham in the state of Alabama where the Tuskegee experiment occurred. We saw the awful pictures and saw how our government, the American government, condoned not giving people what they needed not to die and not to suffer so much. And similarly, we know about how Henrietta Anna Lacks was handled at Hopkins and the way her cells were used without her permission. So we all know that this notion of structural racism is very real. And for many people, there are still questions. For those of us who have scientists who are friends of all races and physicians, we know that we understand well how determined people are to help people of all races. We know NIH is there to support all human beings. But at the same time, there are many people who don't have those personal experiences just wondering, is this for me? So you got the two things going on, a lack of confidence in medicine and science and evidence on the one hand, and then the challenges of discrimination on the other. And what we are saying to people of all races is you have a choice, the virus or the vaccine. And how do we go forward from here? It's important to recognize the history, yes, and to speak the truth, but to say we're in a better place now. And so many of us know that. And the more we can show examples of people of color, for example, and women who are involved with the major efforts to produce the vaccine, the more trust people will have. And so I can tell you several other examples that are great examples of of UMBC graduates who are doing really well in the work with the vaccine. Let me just mention Dr. Caitlin Sattler. She's from middle-class background from Frederick, Maryland, And she is not African-American. She is a wonderful, young, white, middle-class woman, comes to UMBC at 17, graduates in biology, goes on to get a PhD from Hopkins and a postdoc at MIT. And she's now one of the scientists at NIH. And she is leading the study on the asymptomatic patients, the NIH study on the asymptomatic patients. Now, I've got a treat for you because just as you can Google CNN and see Dr. Corbett, you can Google Dr. Caitlin Sattler, S-A-D-T-L-E-R, and see her TED Talk. Her TED Talk has twice as many as mine. I'm lucky talking about pillars of success in science. I've got over a million hits. I'm thrilled. She's got over 2 million hits, and she's about half my age. But her talk is really cool on healing the body. Mine's on success in science. We need that too, but I'm so proud of her. And then the Surgeon General is one of our graduates, Jerome Adams, who, when he came to us from Mechanicsville, Maryland, had never seen a Black doctor. He's African-American. He had never seen one. 
And to see him as the doctor for the country and to have him graduated from UMBC, gone to Indiana, the med school, then to Berkeley for a degree in public health is such a great story. It really is. So there are many more like that. But the key is that uh, universities should be taking pride in the fact we've produced doctors and nurses and social workers and others helping with this disease. But keep in mind the idea of producing scientists who are producing vaccines that will save the world and people they will never see shows you the nobility of science itself. So what is it about UMBC that produces these amazing <laughs> leaders? You know, I would say first point would be just amazing faculty members and administrators who believe in the fact that number one, we can produce young people of all races from all kinds of backgrounds who may be the children of professors or they may be first generation college, but they can be the best. And it's the high standards. We use the word grit a lot. The Chesapeake Bay Retriever is our mascot. And we call UMBC the House of Grit. Nothing takes the place of the hard work. We've got to have the creativity. We've got to have the intellectual curiosity. But at the end of the day, the hard work makes a difference. You might be surprised to know that more than half of my students have at least one parent from another country. And I tell you that because if you look at our scientific infrastructure, you will see large numbers of Americans who are first generation Americans who have really that hunger and that pride in being an American and who are determined to be their best. And we can use those examples to inspire people of all races, children of all races who've been here for generations to say, this is what the rest of the world thinks about us, that, you know, you want to be the best because you've got opportunities in this country. It sounds like though, and we know leadership comes from the top, it sounds like they've got a great cheerleader in you and your enthusiasm for them and your pride in them and your encouragement. That must make all the difference in the world. I appreciate that. Our new book, my colleagues and I have a new book out entitled The Empowered University, Shared Leadership, Culture Change and Academic Success. And the first line in the book, is it's not about me, it's about us. And part of our culture is to say, when we think about leadership, we have to stop thinking about the one person at the top. It's about a group of people with a shared vision. And so the faculty and staff working with our students, we truly believe that it's what we do together that can inspire students to be the best. And that's the best news that I can give you. I have all these great examples people of all races who are in leadership positions, and most important, who care deeply about the human condition. Yeah, you can hear that in your voice. I mean, the human condition. What does that mean? That means a lot of things. Oh, it's the complexity of it. It's about the fact that human behavior is unpredictable. It's about the fact that we have to be prepared for people to act on the basis of what is, in their opinion, best for them that we're all products of our childhood experiences, that we live in a society that has many strengths and many challenges, and that sometimes when people don't see us as being necessarily the best or don't immediately believe we can do the job, we must have a sense of self in knowing I can do this. And even if someone doesn't show that confidence in me at the beginning, my performance will show exactly who I am and what I can do. And I must believe in myself. And so when I think about that complexity of the human condition, it is that for a lot of professionals from underrepresented groups, whether they're women, people of color, first generation college, they see so often the biases that people have in the medical profession, in the scientific profession, not because they're bad people, but because they're accustomed to thinking about a scientist as being one type. If we said to anybody, Dr. Corbett created the vaccine for that, most people will immediately think of a white man who is over 50. So to think about somebody who's a young black woman who is under 40 is not in our experience. It just isn't for anybody. I was talking with a wonderful former professor of mine, a woman who is now in her 80s, who's at a senior's home in Montgomery County. And I was telling her about this. This is a Black woman mathematician. And she said to me, Freeman, that shows how much work we have to do. She said, I never even thought about the possibility that somebody looking like me at a young age could create a vaccine. 
That's how we have to all open our minds to the possibilities if we believe in our children. Well said. It's huge. Yeah, it is so huge. So can we ask you, Dr. Rabowski, you have had the vaccine. I think people are curious, like, what was it like? Well, you know, and remember in the study, this is the Moderna study, half the people get the placebo, the other half will get the vaccine. And so we don't know for sure. What we can tell you, first of all, it's not unexpected that we had sore arms for a day or so. Nothing more than what a shot might do. But what was different was we were so fatigued. We were very tired to the point that we didn't do our regular exercising for two days. Normally, we do a combination of Jackie Pilates and me walking and running and some light lifting, but we just didn't feel like it. It wasn't anything to be afraid of. It's just for us, we knew something was different in our body. And we were happy. We were very glad because we were wanting to get the real vaccine. So we believe we have it. Now, you're going to ask the question, well, suppose you don't have it. We've gotten that question and finally we get the answer. We received a letter in the last week saying that if you did not get the vaccine and you're concerned, you may call us. And in the next few weeks, we will tell you if you've got the vaccine. And if you did not get it, we will give it to you. We'll continue, of course, to use our masks and to be socially distant. So we'll know in the next two weeks. But I'm telling you, we believe we already have the vaccine. And you're saying it didn't hurt. We're hearing, you know, extreme stories, though, that if you have allergies or if you've got this or with that, do you have anything to say about that? We didn't have any of that. I always tell people to consult with their physician because my wife and I, when we went to take the first injection, we had to have an examination. They do that. And my wife went straight through and got the injection. She's waiting for me for some time. And it turns out they would not give me the injection. And the reason is my blood pressure was up and it was not coming down. And I do have high blood pressure, you see, and I take medication. But I love the fact that they were not going to put me in that position. They wanted to know that my physician thought I was okay to do it. So what they suggested was, why don't you go and see your physician first? Or we can get you one here. And I said, I'd go to my own. I did. And he actually changed my medication. And within a week or so, my blood pressure was fine. I went back and I then had the injection. But I say that to say people should talk with their doctors to make sure they're telling them whatever questions they should ask, because they do want people with different conditions. But it's really important to say they want to know what you've had so they can give you advice. But net net, what would you say? Nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. You've got professionals doing this. They care about people. In the Black community, you've got Black leaders coming forth from the heads of those medical schools, those Black medical schools, and they will see more and more people, Dr. Fauci and others, taking the vaccine. And it really takes a long time to get that message out. Bad news always travels fast. Good news, as you all know, you have to really push it to get people to even hear it. Because breaking news is rarely about the good stuff. That's so true. (laughs) And I don't know if you know the answer to this, but what we've been told is that it's important that people take it and take it as soon as we can get it out there and available to people because the sooner this all happens, the faster we can shut it down. That's exactly right. So as soon as people are allowed to take it, they should be taking it. Because the more people we have taking it and the more we see that people are fine, the more comfortable others will become in taking it. And that's why those of us who've had it and who've gone through this need to be out there talking about the fact it's the right thing to do. And it's the right thing to do not only for ourselves, but for our parents and grandparents and our children, because it's not just about us, it's about everybody who's around us. So those of you that have had it or will get confirmed that you've had it, will you wear your masks still? Oh, yes. I like the idea of, of all of us continuing to wear masks until we've got really large numbers of people who've had the vaccine. That's the safest way. And when we look at what's happening in other countries right now, and we look at England, it's very clear, whatever we can do to remain as safe as possible and to support people, we should be doing. The other thing I would say, though, is that this is a time when we have the great opportunity to emphasize to fellow Americans and to people around the world that science matters, that we have to believe in expertise, in the fact that some people know more than others. As we've talked to people and they've had great confidence in saying why they're not going to take it, we've had to go back to just fundamental question, do we trust 
science and scientists. And while it's taking time for people to get there because of historical facts, the reality is the way we build more trust, the way to build more trust in science is to have more people from all backgrounds involved in the scientific enterprise. I think it is a time at every level from our pre-K through 12 system to what we do and talk about with parents to working with elected officials to reaffirm our belief in the importance of science, medicine, public health in our world. You know, it was Abraham Lincoln who is responsible for the establishment of the National Academy of Sciences. When you look at science and medicine and engineering, and it really is significant that during that part of our evolution as a country, that that American leader and people around him understood that our future was inextricably tied to the development of science and the other areas. And there are periods in our understanding of our country and humankind when we get that. And then sometimes we can forget the importance. And then unfortunately, if we have leaders who don't seem to be appreciating that value, people listen to leaders. We need leaders of all types, from all parties, all kinds of backgrounds, conservative, liberal, whatever, talking about, we may have these other differences, but when it comes to science and what we see at NIH and these other areas, we all are together. We must listen to the experts. That has to be the message. The other one that we've not talked about is the importance of the humanities and social sciences during this period. And I can say this as a mathematician and the son of an English teacher. It is also important to understand that it will be our grounding in the humanities that will help us understand what people are going through and why people may not trust and the challenges that poor people face during this period and frontline workers to give us the compassion so that our scientists and our physicians, our engineers and others are not just techies or people seeing us as something to work on, but people who have the human understanding of what people go through and experts who can help us deal with the ethical questions about who gets the vaccine first. Why? And how do we help people become less afraid of it? And so it's a great time, I would say. This is a great time for learning, whether talking about developing the science, but also in using what we know from the social sciences and the humanities to look at our situation as human beings and to determine how to convince more people that we have to have an open mind whether about the vaccine or about how human beings are being treated. It's about learning and education. Have you seen more with this pandemic and systemic racism on the forefront? Have you seen more interest in the sciences at UMBC or in the humanities? What have you seen? I've seen students and faculty and staff at UMBC become even more concerned about each other becoming even more strongly connected, even with the technology. And what I said to colleagues and students recently was, as we go out and we see everybody in the mask, we have no choice but to look into the eyes of people more than ever. If you think about it, you know that before we just pass people, we don't even think about it. But now when you see somebody in the grocery store and I see my students and they want to come up and get close to me and I'm saying, I love you. And let's keep the six feet distance, right? <laughs> I'm older, I'm vulnerable. <laughs> <laughs> but we can look into each other's eyes and I have been amazed at the hope and this hunger that I see in the eyes of people for human connection. This is a time to appreciate each other more than ever. And I have loved the way my colleagues in the humanities and the arts and the social sciences have just taken what they've learned out of those areas and have used that learning in inspiring us all to think about how science fits in with the human situation. I mean, it seems to me that for UMBC, we are one of the leading producers of people of color who go on to get these PhDs in science. And number one for Blacks with MD PhDs, but we have people from around the world. And what's amazing about that is we understand the need for connections. 
across these different groups in different ways. And this has been a period when we've been even more sensitive to that need to connect to people, regardless of background. When students have come from areas that don't have great Wi-Fi, how we create hotspots. For students who may not have the equipment that they need, how we can loan them equipment. But also opportunities to tell students who are in pre-med or in science or whatever the area, this is a great time for you to get into public health and to understand the need and to understand that public health itself is interdisciplinary, that it is about both the science, the medicine, but also the social sciences and other areas. And more than ever, the need to be bridging the gap between those who are in science and medicine with those who are not. Dr. Fauci does that well. Dr. Corbett does that well. When you listen to her, it's not that you're listening to somebody who's sounding like a robot. She's a human being, but she can talk with great clarity. The line that I use with students all the time is, if you really understand a difficult concept, you can explain it to a child. And we have to learn that. We're working to do that in the scientific community more and in the medical community and in engineering. We have to be able to explain to people who are not in those disciplines, we can do much more. My TED Talk focuses on how we help more students to succeed in science and engineering and medicine in those areas. And it's about that nurturing environment and connecting the science to life itself. Dr. Rabowski, this podcast is called Health Gig, and people are interested in how people personally take care of themselves. So could you share with us how you take care of yourself? You touched on it a little bit, mind, body, and spirit. Yes, yes. And sometimes Jackie's on these with me. We said that having the injections, going to the Moderna trial, we saw as our giving ourselves a gift for our anniversary. We just had the special anniversary. We've been married now 50 years. i Got out of college. I was 19. We got married and went to grad school, and it's been a wonderful life. But we said we are so blessed, and of those to whom much is given, much is required. We often have gone on a number of occasions to Paris for our anniversary, and we couldn't. So Jackie brought Paris to Owings Mills, Maryland, from the music to French cuisine to a chef, socially distanced outside the summer to, I mean, the Eiffel Tower, and just it was wonderful. And a part of our anniversary gift to ourselves has been several things over the year, for the whole year, from going, starting off in New York some time ago, has been working to be our best selves. And so we are exercising more than ever. And that means everything from walking and a little running, having a gym, Jackie doing the Pilates, my lifting weights, her lifting some weights, our eating. I'm doing vegetables and salads right now. She may eat a piece of fish or something, but a good protein. Two hour doing Tai Chi together. We take lessons in Tai Chi together. We meditate. We use the Calm app, which is always wonderful in these stressful times. And we laugh a lot. You know, I think humor is the best part of romance. So you got married at 19? How did you meet Jackie? The first math test in the pre freshman year, I thought I was the smartest kid around. And I got the lowest A. There were about seven other kids in the class who got A's, and I had the lowest day, and she was calling the names. And by the time she got, I was 15 at the time. By the time she got to my name, I had tears coming down because I wasn't the smartest kid in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and she said then, she said, okay, Coleman, you have the only perfect paper in the class. And all of a sudden, a girl, a girl got up. You know, at that time, we were all boys and girls. And I was so silly, I hollered out, I'm going to marry her one day. And the whole class laughed because she was so lovely, so beautiful. And I was this fat little kid. They laughed at me. And we became the best of friends first, which is what we always tell, the best of friends. And had a chance to spend and study in Egypt together and travel in Europe as college students. And in my senior year, I proposed. That's great. That's wonderful. Yeah. So I always tell students, when you are in a classroom with another person who is seemingly much better than you are, don't get jealous. Just plan to marry them. <laughs> get married. <laughs> well, Dr. Rabowski, this has been such fun and such valuable information. And we're so impressed by what you're doing there at UMBC. And it's just been a pleasure to have you. Thank you both so much. Thank you for joining us on Health Gig. We loved having you with us. We hope you'll tune in again next week. In the meantime, be sure to like and subscribe to this podcast and follow us on healthgigpod.com. I'm Trisha. And I'm Doral. Be well. 
To learn more on how to live a co-mindfulness life, visit comindfulnessproject.com.